So uh, we are live, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon uh, from uh, beautiful Long Island and, uh, uh, and sunny Manhattan. <laughs> so we have a, uh, this is Gene Panosanko, your host on the uh, straight and unfiltered. That's my channel. Um, I'm your host here and we have a distinguished guest today, uh, Mr. Leon Choate, who is trust and estate attorney. And uh, he has been in business for decades. I mean, his resume reads, uh, you know, some of the best names uh, that you can think of. So he's a senior, uh, he's a managing partner. He spent his career that spans over decades. Uh, he worked as a senior partner at Putney Tumbley Hall, uh, Hurston of New York, New Jersey and Florida. He served as general counsel to Commercial Trust Company of New Jersey, Commercial Bank Shares and United Jersey Bank, which is now uh, Bank of America. So Leon served on the board of directors of the New York City Rescue Mission, NYC Rescue Mission Foundation, uh, Hudson County Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Hudson County Tax Research uh, Council, Stetson University School of Business, 200E Tenants Corporation, Middlesex uh, County Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, Arts uh, Horizons, Boy Scouts of New Jersey, and NYU Executive Forum. He was trustee, chairman of the Planned Giving Committee, and chairman of the Men's Fellowship at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Uh, Leon has been on the advisory boards of New York, uh, strike that, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, the American Heart Association of New York and Northern New Jersey, Peacock Gladstone Bank, Fleet Bank, Bank of America, North Fork Bank, Valley Hospital, Ridgewood, New Jersey, and Lincoln Center. So again, the list goes on and on. Leon, pleasure having you on the channel. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. Well, it, it's truly a pleasure to have somebody of your level, uh, uh, you know, on, on my channel. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor. I have known you for many, many, many years. Uh, we have been effectively advising, you know, some of the joint clients where, you know, I would send to you some clients uh, looking for legal advice, being it, you know, corporate advice, uh, foundation, uh, you know, formation of the business, uh, corporation, whatever the case may be. Uh, your specialty actually is trust and estates. Uh, your partner, he is offering a comprehensive advice on different levels of immigration law. And that's something that some of my clients have been looking for uh, as well. Uh, and you've been kind enough to reciprocate and make introductions to some of your clients looking for wealth management, retirement planning, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and things of that nature, risk management as well. So again, uh, welcome to the channel, Leon. Please share with our distinguished audience, uh, you know, how you got in the business, which again, goes back uh, decades and how, how the whole evolution of your legal uh, industry has been uh, going and your involvement in multitude of different entities, some of them of the national and international caliber. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I started off by going to NYU undergraduate, went to GW Law School, and then I had a fellowship uh, to seek an MBA. I always loved the law, and I was fascinated by the fact that the law changes, you have to change, and your clients have to change to meet the demands we face. And right now, we're in a different era. We're in uncharted waters. And I'm dealing with clients and planning during this period. Um, as you know, we have an election coming. Uh, not being political in any, but not being political in any way. There are a couple things we got to really consider. Number one, no matter who succeeds, taxes are going to have to change. Taxes are going to have to go up. We are spending trillions and trillions of dollars as a result of this pandemic. This is going to continue into next year. We're going to have to raise money. And so I'm concerned about 
protecting my client's wealth. And number two, how to pass this on successfully to further generations. For example, I think the first thing that will be attacked, especially if the Democrats are successful, is the federal exemption for estate taxes. Right now, that figure stands at 11 million 500,000. So for a married couple, for a married couple, we're looking at close to $23 million. 23 million, that's correct, Jim. That's going to change. Um, I could see it going down to three or two million, where it was about 2010. And if you recall, the next year, because Congress didn't act, there was no estate tax. And then this graduated program developed where. Um, we have a $23 million exam. Right. So what am I doing? I'm advising my clients, if they're capable, to take advantage of those exemptions. That exemption can be either used at death or during your lifetime. Right. And the way you utilize it during your lifetime is going to be by gifting, gifting real property, personal property, other types of property, including businesses, right? By shares of stock or interest in partnerships or holding companies, whatever. Right. I'm advising my clients to look at that carefully as a possible, because we're going to have to raise money and that's going to be the easiest way to raise money is by reducing the exemption. Right now, with the exemption at roughly $23 million, less than 3,000 people who die in the United States are subject to that tax. Right. Now, Gene, I practice in both New York and New Jersey. I'm admitted to both bars. And you're also a, uh, appointed to the Supreme Court as far That's as- That's correct. Yeah. Um, right now in New Jersey, there is no inheritance or estate tax. Right. And the reason that developed was many wealthy, individuals in New Jersey or people with businesses were moving out because of the estate. Right. New York has not been that kind. New York has an estate tax, which is at $5,186,000 tied to inflation. Right. However, New York as a bomb in that tax. If you're one penny over, you have 5,186,001 right. cent. Right. The entire amount is taxable. Right. So what I've been doing, especially with my New York clients, is meeting with them going over their assets right. and attempting to split the assets, especially between husband and wife. Right. I have a client right now that has about 12 or $13 million. Right. He would have been subject to a New York estate tax, which is at the rate of 16%. Right. I have had him put over 5 million into his wife's name, 5 million into his name, one or 2 million into children's names. Therefore, his estate 
or her estate, Ms. Scott, right. will not be subject to either federal estate tax or the state or New York or New Jersey state tax. That's an so this is another thing I'm doing. One of the problems I'm finding with dealing with clients over the years, clients don't realize how much they're worth or what they have. But that's yet another reason why we always recommend to periodically sit down with a legal advisor, financial advisor, wealth management uh, you know, team, a CPA accounting firm that has been advising those clients to just review the assets. We have, seen, we have seen incredible rebound of the markets over the last few years. You know, even during the pandemic, the market has been doing exceptionally well. And what happens a lot of times, as you pointed correctly on, a lot of clients, they're absolutely unaware that they grew their assets, you know, by certain percentage. Uh, and, and therefore, they already fall into that category where the state is going to be subject to uh, federal or in some cases also New York state uh, estate tax, uh, in addition to the income tax, obviously, that always kicks in. Uh, and, and basically, they rob themselves. They allow that money to go to Uncle Sam, Uncle Cuomo, whoever is on the list, you know, uh, standing to inherit to take a cut of that, uh, of that money. Um, the point also I wanted to make that, that here in New York, you know, we have plenty of folks that have been living here for many years or decades, Leon, as you can attest probably, uh, again, we advise uh, very often uh, similar clients or the very same clients, but after years or sometimes decades of life here in the U.S., while they do have, you know, green cards, they never took a U.S. citizenship. So it is very critical for those folks to understand that unless they become a U.S. citizen, they and their families and their estate is not going to be in that beneficial position of what we have right now. I mean, I had a client that was a German citizen, but she lived in the US far longer than the amount of time she spent in, um, back in Germany. Uh, she died at a relatively young age. And unfortunately, again, the state has been taxed at some uh, ungodly rate because she never took a US citizenship and therefore she was not exempt from a certain amount of funds that would be normally available for the US citizens. Thank you for bringing that up, Gene. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, the exemption is 11,500,000 per person. Right. If your spouse is a non US citizen, right. the exemption doesn't apply. You're only allowed slightly under $200,000, which is a meaningless amount compared with millions of dollars that will go out the window to pay again federal and state, estate, and income taxes. Right. Yeah. And so, therefore, you have to have a qualified domestic trust, which means there's got to be a U.S. trustee involved. Right. And the reason for that is this. If the first spouse dies, the United States doesn't want the second spouse or the surviving spouse to go with the assets out of the country. They want to be able to tax. Going back to my original point where people don't realize how wealthy they are, I think the easiest way to look at that is this. The United States taxes everything you have worldwide, yeah. including the value of the shirt you have on your back. There is no way to avoid these taxes. However, there are mechanisms and tools available to postpone these taxes to succeeding generations to lower the amount number one of the total tax due, and secondly, to reduce it among the number of people. For example, in my situation, I have a son who has three wonderful children. I have structured my estate so the first time taxes would be paid is when my grandchildren pass away. I have three grandchildren, ages 10, 
eight and five. You shared with it, you shared with me on those pictures of those wonderful kids. And again, I do hold that at some point right now, they're way too young, but I do hope that down the line, years or probably decades from now, they will appreciate all the wisdom and all the skills you put into putting together those estate instruments to really protect their assets. Another thing we're facing today is this. We're dealing so much digitally. Our assets are not in a safe deposit box. They're listed on a computer somewhere. What happens if you die and no one knows your passcode, your word, or how to get into these records? We've got to develop relationships and trust so someone can assist a survivor to locate and marshal your assets so they can protect themselves if they're a beneficiary or their other loved ones who might be benefited. And this is becoming a critical point. I used to tell clients, keep things in one room, bank books, certificate of deposits, et cetera. They're non-existent to them. When have you seen a bank book? It's all on the computer system. True. And so we've got to cover not only assets that we could touch, we could hold in our hands, but all these other assets that are on our computer or held by our computer. For example, gold, silver, blockchain. Right. You own a coin, but it's not a specific coin. It may be in South Africa. It may be in Germany. These are the new, new challenges we face. So what I like to do is this. When I meet with a client, I not only want to meet with that client to find out what he or she would like to do, but meet with their advisors, their accountants, their financial consultants, their insurance consultants so that we're all on the same page. And you're making such a great point on that, uh, Leon. I mean, one of the many reasons why I enjoyed meeting with you and then eventually as we develop that trust and confidence, understanding the value that, you know, together as professionals, we can bring to the clients serving the same goal, which is multiplying and protecting the client's assets. I mean, I, I truly enjoy working with you. I have all the comfort level making referrals of my clients to you, whatever they're looking for. And, uh, and you have been very, uh, very kind in reciprocating in that respect too. Uh, we, we, we do have the clients that again are complaining, hey, you know, I've been dealing with this advisor, but I was not told about those kind of things. And you're the first person which is really telling me about how it works in reality. So what we are seeing, unfortunately, a lot more often than I would like to see, and I'm sure you will agree with that, you know, many people, you know, being attorneys or CPAs or financial advisors, wealth managers of different uh, types and colors, they're preaching the so-called, you know, holistic approach. However, uh, at the end of the day, I don't know what, uh, what the motivation is, but they have, I guess, that insecurity of sharing, in, in their opinion, the client's relationship because they feel that they're gonna lose that client. I, I, I'm completely opposite in that respect. I feel that working with professionals like yourself, like uh, skillful CPAs and other advisors, as a team, we can bring together the whole picture and advise the client uh, to the client's ma maximum benefits. The other thing is that I'm finding which is beneficial is this. People are not aware of techniques that are available. I mentioned something earlier. Right. You can't avoid taxes. But, but you there can are mechanisms. You can minimize the damage. 
That's correct. For example, by creating partnerships, by not owning a hundred percent of the property or the asset. Right. In that case, you have a discount available to you of both lack of marketability and lack of majority. For example, years ago, I had a client that owned about $60 million worth of real estate in New York, mostly yeah, rental. A sizable chunk. Yeah. That's correct. He never owned one piece of property 100%. Right. I was able to get a discount of 58%. That's remarkable. That translates into lack of marketability. Millions, millions of dollars to the client's bottom because line. Because it's easy to sell one piece of property. But if I own that property with another person, sure. you don't want to be involved with that other person. You may not even know who that other person is. That other person may not even be a human being. Right. It could be a corporation. It yep. could be a partnership. It could be a limited liability corporation. Yep. And so these are the techniques that I like to work with accountants, with financial planners in structuring and planning their asset disposition. I have a situation right now where a client has a phenomenal business. He's been extremely, extremely successful. How do you begin passing that on to someone else? He's young. However, you know, we're learning in this pandemic. Right. It's not just one person that passes away. It's many people. It's many people of different ages. So true. And we're learning for the first time that we've got to be prepared. We've got to be planning. I had a client years ago. He told me his mother died. She worked for the city of New York. She had very limited assets. Right. I said to him, I want you to go down to the city of New York and meet with the human resource team. Right. Find out what your mother had, because he did not know in terms of insurance or retirement. So they never discussed designated beneficiary on the retirement no. plan, any succession, you know, scenario, which is again, it's not uncommon as we both know. What is the percentage, Leon? Like 63% of Americans die without any, forget about the state plan. I mean, the people don't have a basic will, correct? It's even higher than that. It, or a will that's not affected. Right. But continuing that story for one moment. Right. His mother was from the old school. She worked every day. And she saved. <laughs> well, we found out, and he didn't want to go. I said, you've got to go. You gotta go. He went. He found out his mother had accumulated 1,284 sick days. It's incredible. That's almost four years four of years. salary. You would not have picked that up without delving into it. I ask clients to take certain steps if someone passes away, immediately control the mail and have it forwarded to a proper place. Because you're gonna find in a quarter of a year, statements, benefits, clients may have annuities, right. clients may have life insurance. I had a woman that had five policies, I found out she took them out. Her mother took them out 80, 90 years ago. And she was a baby. Insurance, and somebody came to your door and you gave them a quarter every week. Those were the dull good days, yeah. Right. So it's important to understand 
why we got to look at everything in our planning and in our distribution. You're making such. I allow clients. So I'm just pointing out, Leon, that you're making such valid points. I mean, it's so critically important to have those instruments in place, to have those strategies implemented. Again, everything should be customized depending on the personal needs, uh, you know, the person and the family and the beneficiaries. But at the end of the day, as you and I know well, the people, a lot of the folks out there, they know that they have the issue to be addressed, but they're just unwilling because of gazillion excuses not to sit down with a team of professionals to have a you know a direct conversation discussion of what what's happening right now, but more importantly about what can be done, what kind of strategies and plans can it should be implemented for their personal benefits, and that's why again by by deferring those days when if at any point those plans will get implemented, a lot of folks they pass away again they don't need to be 90 years old we don't need to have a pan pandemic like COVID or swine flu whatever the case may be. You know, people get in accidents, you know, they can be in their 30s and 40s and 50s uh, and they they die prematurely without any kind of planning. And the state is responsible for very sizable um, amounts of money that, again, could benefit a lot of great things, being at the family or the things that people care about. You have been on the board, you know, of the, you know, New Jersey Symphonic Orchestra. You've been on the board of, of some of the finest cultural institutions. And a lot of people probably would like to have their names being at the Metropolitan Museum or, you know, Guggenheim or the same Carnegie Hall where you live nearby. Uh, but again, uh, because of the lack of planning, that money, instead of being spent the way that those, uh, the owners would like to be spent upon their demise, those funds, they end up going to the federal and the state governments. Gene, I've been doing this for almost 55 years. You got in the business of age of seven, right, Leon? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. I know you do. But and the reason I enjoy it is this. I think it's fascinating to look at people and realize how they became successful and join them with their accomplishments. But the other thing is, it's interesting because every family has issues, crises, difficult. So true. We've got to deal with those in order to proper plan and state. And that is so critical. There are ways to deal with it. If you have a child that has a difficulty, whether it's physical or mental, there are ways to protect that child. For example, I always tell people, when they tell me what their assets are, you forgot the most valuable assets you have, your children. What happens if something happens to you and your children are a minor, or your children are disabled for whatever reason. Right. Who's going to take care of it? We could discuss, put in our document, a guardian of the property and a guardian of the person of that child. For example, we may not want the child to have all our resources for whatever reason especially if there's a disability, because many of the programs that are available to people with disabilities, with people with difficulties, are not available if there's money. And you yeah. cannot buy these programs right. in the open market. They're so developed, so sophisticated. And so it's important to begin to develop a trust relationship with clients, with their professionals to deal with these problems. We now have a pandemic. How am I approaching 
this pandemic in my practice. Number one, as I said, I'm looking at state plans and seeing whether changes have to be made. But secondly, I'm looking at healthcare proxies that we have a right to designate a person to make decisions for us if we're not capable of making those decisions ourselves. The pandemic has taught us something. You could live on a two for two months, three months, four months. Is that what you want? We could discuss that. The same thing with power of attorneys. A power of attorney is a document which states that you could act for me in my place in STEM with my assets as long I am alive, even if I'm disabled. That's a very, very important decision. And it's just not putting a person's name there. You want to make sure that person follows your wishes. You want to make sure that person doesn't use a mechanism like gifting and gifting to themselves. I tell clients the most important decisions you're going to make in your race estate planning is naming your executive, naming your trustee, naming your attorney, in fact, for your power of attorney, naming your healthcare process, naming your guardian. And the reason for that is this. If you're gone, you're not going to have that money anymore. You're not going to have the ability to make that. If your person that you designate makes a mistake and loses that money, it's lost. Your children are lost. Your grandchildren may be. This is how critical this decision-making process is. I, I can't agree with you more in that respect, Leon. I've seen countless, countless number of cases where some of the you know, smartest people I came across, some of the you know, most successful business owners or corporate executives, professionals, they would be fortunate to have accumulated sizable amounts of funds. And yet again, because of multitude of different reasons and excuses, they would not be willing to sit down and, and have this uh, direct discussion with an attorney, with a financial advisor, you know, and the team, you know, as far as what would be in the best interest of their family, what would be in the best interest of the estate, how you can protect those assets, how you can minimize the damage mitigate the risk, you know, defer any kind of potential taxes um, to, to more down the line. And, and the outcomes, you know, the consequences uh, in a lot of cases, they, they're pretty devastating. It could have been avoided if those things were taken, uh, if those steps were taken and those kind of uh, strategies uh, and instruments were implemented uh, in their clients, uh, in the client's lives in the States. And that leads me to another point, Gene. I like to name in my documents, a person that is in that family because they know the people involved. But I also like a co, a co-trustee, a co-executive. Who is an outsider? That's an outsider, that's a professional. I mean, I have a financial background. I have a degree in that. I have a MBA in that, right. but I don't follow the financial field every day. Right. I've got to turn to a person like you. Thank you. Who's more familiar. For example, years ago, people held Kodak stock, a great, great American company. Right. If you still held it today, it's worth what? A cent? 
through sense? It's a shame, but this is a great example that one of the most venerable institutions in business for, for decades, for generations, they basically um, you know, went down to, to zero almost overnight. You know, new technologies came up. They have not been fast enough to recognize the competition. You know, they've been sitting on the sidelines when some other companies have been developing new technologies and ultimately they ended up being left in the dust. And this is unfortunately not the isolated incident as you and I both have seen. Uh, not in New York, but in New Jersey, you could write a document, a personal letter, right. that disposes of a lot of your personal property. Right. I could see on your wall, you've got some very nice pictures. They are, thank you. Um, in New York, we don't have that. Right. right. But Gene, if I would tell you that picture above your head, if you wanted to go to your son, Bill, I would just take a piece of Band-Aid tape, put it on the back of that, right. and that goes to Bill. Why do I say that? Right. Most difficulties dealing with an estate are fights right. over specific, stupid, immaterial items and they get really I went ugly. to court it's really ugly I've seen it more than once again in my career with uh, dealing with multitude of different clients so truly and I don't know how valuable that picture is but I don't think this is priced but to fight over that a lot of sentimental value yeah and the fight sometimes is not caused by the children for example a mother sees daughter a Right. When I die, I want you to have my pearls. Right. Next week, daughter B comes. She says the same thing. Huh. Mother dies. The two girls are fighting. Right. And so I'm trying to avoid these difficulties by setting forth in legal documents, in private documents, and in statements what I want, including what I want for my final resting place, service, or trip. Very important. A lot of those issues, I guess, they, they have so many different aspects, you know, sentimental aspects, you know. So the people that are just scared, again, I, I'm speaking from, uh, from my own experience of dealing with the clients where they, they nod, you know, and they completely agree with everything that I may be saying when it comes down to, you know, property estate planning, yet they don't want to be involved because their rationale is, hey, you know, I don't want this kid of mine hate me because he or she is going to be left with less assets because I feel that that's the right decision to make because he or she is making double or triple of what my other child is making. And it's uh, it, it just common sense to distribute those assets differently. So a lot of people, they're just not willing to discuss those kind of issues and deal with the problems when they're still alive. They're saying, hey, you know, whatever, whatever is left over, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, even provided the fact that the state may be subject to 40, 50, you know, 60% tax loss at the end of the day when the whole thing is taken care of. We know that. Gene, one of the things I say to my clients, if they are hesitant in discussing these subjects, do you want to leave a hell behind? Because if you don't, make decisions that's what you're going to do it's going to be ugly yeah it's going to be a family fight family feud that can drag for years or decades sometimes as we know and we have seen those cases right and left and it's just so much easier less expensive for a fraction of that course you can take care of those issues today and then again at the end of the day it's uh, your family it's your estate it's the things that you care about being at the metropolitan museum or the foundation of arts or the military, you know, personnel or wounded veterans, whatever is near and dear to 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 the to the people, you know, my clients specifically and your clients, uh, can it should be addressed at a fraction of a cost uh, than letting it just go by by itself? And ultimately, again, the price is uh, is just astounding. Gene, one other thought, um, and I've been developing this. I have a person in my firm who's not an attorney who helps my clients with issues dealing with insurance. 
payments, Medicare, Medicaid. So many people lose benefits because they're not aware of them. Gene, you and I have an opportunity to work with our clients to help them in these various tasks. It's getting more difficult. You don't know what's covered. You don't know what's not covered. It is so true, Leon. And a lot of times, again, it's really just a lack of education because of the lack of time that the people have making that money and spending the money instead of sitting down with a team of professionals and having a direct, you know, honest uh, conversation, discussion about, uh, you know, what can be done to uh, maximize the benefits and minimize the damage. You know, speaking of insurance, you know, long-term care insurance is something that I've been passionately advocating over, you know, many, many, many years, 24 years in business. Uh, you know, living in New York, for example, you know, we're seeing cases where long-term care 24-7 costs up to a quarter million dollars a year. So all the people have is just about a million dollars. That money is going to last them only for the long-term care uh, benefits. It's going to go up for only four years. And what's going to happen afterwards? So, uh, you know, I passionately address those kind of issues with the clients, explaining to them that the whole problem can be taken care of for a fraction of the cost. Uh, if you don't address it today, you know, with me or any other professional, being it legal professional, you know, CPA professional, depending on the issue you're looking to uh, to resolve. So, Gene, Leon, there's an, another opportunity for you. I'm finding this very often. Clients have a lot of insurance, yeah, with an exemption of 11 million and 22 right. million. Do they need all that insurance? Or can that policy be used to buy something else, possibly a long-term care policy? I had a client who had an insurance trust for education. He was talking about his retirement and planning for retirement. He didn't have the funds to properly plan for it. Right. I said, why do you have this insurance trust for education? Right. He said, well, it's for my children. I said, how old are your children? 40 he years said, old. 47 and 49. Yeah, done with any kind of schooling by then. Yeah. You know what I did? I picked up the phone and called his insurance consultant right. and said, what can we do? How do we solve the problem? And that's where it's important that you and I and other people understand we cannot do it alone we've got to work together it's all about the team effort leon and it's all about educating the clients uh the example you gave is a perfect example and i've been dealing with that uh type of issues you know many 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 times over over years you know old life insurance policies they did not have a fraction of the benefits that the new life insurance policies are offering you know the new life insurance contracts they offer the whole spectrum of living benefits that would be including uh, long-term care coverage, for example. So the advice that you provided to your client, you know, with the help of his older insurance uh, agent, I mean, obviously has been a lot, a lot more helpful to the client should that uh, old insurance policy just expire. Because again, uh, the education has been taken care of and the need for those educational funds, which was the case in point at the inception of the contract, it was not the case any longer. So obviously, again, the team effort, reviewing what the clients have, advising them properly on uh, what would be the most helpful and beneficial, it's critical to them. And again, I'm fortunate to have you as my uh, good friend and strategic partner, Leon, where we have been able to help uh, you know, clients jointly working as a team and, and hopefully going forward, you know, as, uh, you know, as we reopen from this COVID-19 lockdown, which may or may not be happening anytime soon, but by having those kind of conversations online, hopefully uh, more people are going to learn about what can be addressed, what should be reviewed. And uh, obviously the clients can always get in touch with, uh, with an expert of your level. Leon, I'm going to post all the information on your company, the address, you know, the email and the phone numbers. But before we wrap up our conversation today, I would like you to personally state your phone number, your email, um, you know, at least a couple addresses. I know you have multitude of offices here in the U.S. You have some, some of them overseas in Europe, but
but please state at least your New York contact information here so that the people can get in touch with you for any kind of complimentary review. Well, thank you, Gene, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Leon Choate Jr. Choate is spelled C-H-O-A-T-E. My email is L Choate, C-H-O-A-T-E, J-R for junior at gmail.com. My telephone number is 201-320-9516. That's a direct line into wherever I am, whether I'm in the office in New York or New Jersey or somewhere else. I can attest to that, Leon, except for the only time when you were climbing the mountain of Machu Picchu. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that was the only time when you picked up the you have not picked up the phone on my on my phone call when I had a client in front of me and we jointly were calling you from my office. But that's excusable. But otherwise, I know you're picking up the phone in any kind of, uh, you know, day, uh, you know, rain or shine, uh, morning, afternoon, sometimes late night, because when the client needs help, then you're ready to, to, to step in and, and offer your your, your advice and expertise. <laughs> Go ahead. Please. And I'm finding that more important. You know, a person stays home and looks at the news all day. Right. You're pretty depressed by six o'clock in the evening. It's horrible. It's going when on. you're living alone, a small thing becomes something important to you. And I want my clients to have the ability, I know you do the same thing, to be able to be feel free to contact us anytime. And that's the benefit. There is no question that's not important. It's one of the best things that the expert uh, professional of any type can offer to his clients, his dedication, his loyalty, his availability, his commitment, because a lot of times, again, people are being promised the world and then, you know, you're getting feedback, hey, you know, it takes me days, sometimes weeks to get a phone call back just on a basic issue. So it's really very unfortunate, but I'm glad to have you as a great strategic partner, Leon, uh, who is always available to provide the highest level of advice and expertise. So well, thank you and be safe. Likewise, Leon. So again, thank you so much for getting on the channel. Uh, I do hope that the audience has been enjoying uh, this, uh, this conversation. If you do, please hit like uh, of this program. Please subscribe to the channel. We're meeting with wonderful professionals, you know, attorneys, CPAs, corporate executives, business owners, they share their life stories like Leon Cho did today. So hopefully you folks have been enjoying this presentation. All right, thank you very much again, Leon. Stay safe, stay well, and God bless, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Leon.